Good evening. Nice crowd. You must have. Uh, are we looking at the RB Camper Ordinance again? Is that it? <laughs> that usually draws the big crowds. Anyway, uh, welcome to our City Council meeting for the month of August. Uh, if you would please silence your electronic devices so that we can uh, have an undisturbed meeting. If you would like to address the City Council, we have little yellow cards outside the doorways. You can fill those out, bring them up to us, and we'll allow you to speak in front of us. We have two different opportunities. We have the media in the back of the room. Uh, we enjoy having them here also. And uh, didn't have a chance to check because we went from one meeting to another meeting. Do we have our, our Reverend uh, Pastor George Thomas with us? There he is, Pastor yeah. Thomas, if you would. He's going to... Lead us in vocation. If for some reason you don't uh, care to participate, you, know, you may step outside of the room and come back in at the invocation. And then if you would, uh, Pastor Thomas, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance also. Please stand. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We give you glory for being here this evening. As we go forth for the business of the day, we pray for your wisdom for every situation that will arise tonight. We thank you for those that are here tonight. We pray, Father God, that you continue to guide this council with wisdom, and we pray that you continue to bless our city. For this, we give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor. The pastor was brought to us compliments of People's Missionary Baptist Church. And we appreciate that. Uh, our sign in device is on strike tonight. Uh, so I will note the fact that we have one councilman absent. Our councilman Shannon Hayes is out of town right now. And other than that, we have uh, our four council member, uh, members here, as well as the mayor, city clerk, our city attorney, department heads. And, and all of our fine people in the audience. Anybody have any objections to tonight's agenda? Anything need to be withdrawn or? Okay, seeing no objections, uh, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. And we're gonna move on to Mayor Cadle, who has a couple of special presentations. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> 10 years ago, we had a very uh, special day when we officially opened Station 3 of the Fire Department on Brook Beach. And we had applied for a safer grant because we had to have people to, uh, to man that department. We got a safer grant for 12 firefighters. It was great because that's the only time I've got to swear fire, fire, firefighters in. We don't normally do that. It was a great experience opening it up at the same time. Had these folks, we have six of them here tonight with us and we're going to recognize their 10 years of service with us. So the fellas come on up. <coughs> and they've done a great job. And Chief Holland, it's sort of hard to think now <laughs> that there was actually controversy about uh, that safer grant and hiring 12. I don't hear anybody complaining anymore. <laughs> yeah, amen. They put a few fires out and saved a few lives in that time. So I appreciate you guys very much. I swear, you know, I'm always talking about firefighters. You see a fire, you run toward it. I'm running the other way. Get as far away from it. What you do is just remarkable, and I appreciate that very much. You see up here, the picture of that day, they're about ready to receive their help. So we're in alphabetical here. Senior Service Award presented to Matthew Baker, July 2nd, 2008, July 2nd, 2018. Senior Service Award presented to Matthew Cunningham. Senior Service Award presented to Nicholas Stowell. Okay. Senior Service Award to Joshua Ferguson. Senior Service Award to the person who pulled all this together, Corey Winkler. 
be your servant. Oh. Did I get somebody to? Oh, I was like, man, I was, I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20 years. She got two of them. for you, no. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see. I'm glad these last year. Paul Wotowitz. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask him outside because I've never pronounced it correctly in the 10 years that he's been with us. But uh, the, the uh, it reads about uh, uh, for honorable and dedicated services daily rendered by these highly valued employees, the quality of time and effort utilized to complete each and every task exceedingly above minimal standards with excellence. And for all the duties you have accomplished within these 10 years, we're highly appreciated and commended for services rendered to the citizens of the city of Preston. Now, Chief, Want to talk about these fellas? And tell some lies here. You know. <laughs> uh, well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, uh, it's been an honor to work with each one of these guys. Um, they all have contributed to the growth of this department. Um, yeah, it just it makes me proud. It really does make me proud as the chief of the department. Um, starting out where I did and moving my way up, I think whenever they came on board, I was the battalion chief then? Yeah, fire inspector. The fire inspector and the battalion chief. Um, that was a huge event. Um, it was great to have all of them on board. And for a department to retain even this many out of a group, because usually over time, a lot of the guys think the grass is greener on the other side. And so we had some that have that left and went to South County. We've actually had some that went to neighboring, uh, neighboring counties. Um, we've had some that even went all the way down to South Florida around Tampa area. Um, but really and truly, whenever you talk with a lot of them, they all wish they never left. And uh, these gentlemen right here has uh, stuck it out through uh, our growth. Um, they stuck it out, still sticking it out, uh, with our growing pains, the way we're moving forward uh, with our department. Um, I mean, I could sit up here mainly all night if I just wanted to work my way right down the line. Um, well, except for him. Um, <laughs> uh, all of them have made me absolutely proud and it's an absolutely honor to have them associated with our department, and uh, I hope I get 10 more years out of them. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. for these guys. Tell them what the different medals stand for. 
Okay, so I got two golds, one bronze, and a fourth. One of the golds, I got in the 10K. Another one I got in a 4x400. Four the bronze, I got in a 5K, and this I got in a 3K, the fourth place. Tell us what you thought of your experience out there. It was wonderful. <laughs> to be honest, uh, the weather over there was less humid, nicer. It's still nice here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cooler. It's a little cooler. You know, I, I felt the difference. It was nice. My first plane ride there and my second plane ride there. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was nice. Right. I'm very proud of out with my team and making buddies with my opponents and other coaches. It was wonderful. Very good. You uh, you did us proud. The highest award that I can present to you is the key to the city. Mm -hmm. Key to the city of Crestview is presented to Harrison Malden. Outstanding achievement, 2018 Special Olympics USA Games. Moving on to the uh, approval of minutes, any objections to the minutes from the June 25th special meeting or the July 9th council meeting or the July 23rd special meeting? No objections, they are passed by unanimous consent. And we'll move on to public hearings. First public hearing on CDBG grant application. Oh, hold on, oh, Mr. Fox has disappeared on me. Just go ahead and open the public meeting and we'll go find Mr. Fox. Okay. I'll be right back. Fred Fox, Fred Fox Enterprises. This is the uh, first of two public hearings that are required for the city to apply for a community development block grant in the economic development category. DEO requires a sign and sheet be passed around, so I'm going to start that to start. Uh, basically, this is the FFY 2017 application cycle. These are federal fiscal year funds from 2017. There's four categories. The um, housing category, which is where you rehab or replace homes that are owned or occupied by low moderate income people. The commercial revitalization category, which is where you do downtown streetscape improvements like we've done years ago here. And the neighborhood revitalization category, which is where you do public work pro works projects, uh, either in low-income neighborhoods or in the, we did a couple of projects at your sewer plant years ago. All three of those categories closed about two hours ago, five o'clock this afternoon. In, and so the only category that's available under the 17 funding currently is the economic development category. And in the economic development category, typically they uh, don't get enough applications to use up all the funds initially, and that's the case this year as it's been for the, a lot, number of years. 
And then after the application due date, which again was about two hours ago, as applications come in, it's now t on a timing basis. First come, first serve. You get reservations, and, and your score doesn't matter. It's all about t getting your application before the next guy uh, until the money runs out. Um, the city's eligible to apply for, in the other three categories, $750,000, but in up to seven fifty. But in the economic development category, up to a million five. But it's conditioned upon the developer you're working with uh, creating a certain number of jobs. Basically, for every full-time equivalent job, new full-time equivalent job that developer is committing to create, the city can apply for up to thirty-four thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. And you can apply up to a million five, but he has to commit to and actually create 43 full time equivalent jobs. If we apply for a million five and he creates 40, the city's the state's going to want you to pay back the difference. So, um, typically, what you have as part of this is you have what's called a participating party agreement, which is a required document DEO requires that normally doesn't have a whole lot of teeth in it, it's just everybody. The developer guaranteeing to do certain things, you're guaranteeing to do certain things, and, and, and it goes in with the application. We also recommend that you do a developer's agreement, which is a second agreement, and it actually has teeth. Either you're asking for a line of credit from the, the developer until your exposure is gone, or a bond from the developer until your exposure is gone, because the contracts between you and the state and then you've got a secondary contract with the developer, but if he doesn't perform, you put this infrastructure in, and he doesn't either create any jobs or create the number that's committed to, the state's going to want to get paid back, and it's HUD money. So you can't get a waiver to not pay it back. Um, so that's, that's basically how it works. And this is for infrastructure that is needed for the business. Um, there's a chart of, we talk about low moderate income, of the jobs that are created, by the developer, at least 51% need to be for people with no more than a high school education. You can actually hire people that have no more than a high school education, but the job description of at least 51% of the jobs needs to be for people that initially have no more than a high school education. And then on the back end, when they're actually hiring people, at least 51% of the people they hire need to be from low moderate income households um, in the county they live in. Um, before they're, for the year before they're employed. And there's a form that we have them fill out through the developer to verify that. And for some reason, they didn't meet those criteria. Again, it could mean payback, and that's why you keep that developer's agreement in place until you basically have the grant administratively closed out. Uh, there's points for leverage, but again, we're not concerned about points at this point, because if we were going in the other categories, we'd be talking about that. Uh, there is points for up to a million two hundred fifty thousand dollars of their leverage in the sense of whatever they're building, they would just need to document that. We won't, we're not going to be asking for that in the application or uh, claiming that for points in the application. But basically, you'll submit the or we'll submit the application on your behalf. DEO will review it, come out about thirty days later, and make sure that it is everything is as we said and the work has started. And then uh, once they go back and offer you a contract, one of the pieces that have to go back in within 60 days of that contract offer is proof that all their financing is in place. There's some other stuff that is just moving paper around and proving stuff, but the big one and the one that normally kills a deal is the developer under, underestimates how long it's going to take him to get his financing, a full-blown commitment from his lender. He doesn't have to close the loan, but we'll need a letter from his lender saying the only condition is a grant. Um, and again, there's there, there's a process where you can set up a citizens group. We don't we're not asking you to do that because that's just points in the application. It's not a threshold requirement. Um, we did advertise this public hearing, and like I said, from this, assuming you want to move forward with the developer of a project, the next ad we run on your behalf will actually have details of the project. Uh, and then after that public hearing is held, assuming you still want to submit the application, you would pass some resolutions and we would submit the application on your behalf to the state. Um, so that's the process. And the primary purpose tonight 
is to decide if you want to move ahead with a project with a developer. The pu purpose of the public hearing tonight is to get public input as to whether the public is interested in you moving ahead with a project with a developer and to make sure there's no other developers out there that might be interested in and say, well, you just ran running through with, with this guy. What about <laughs> us? So that's the two purposes of this public hearing tonight is, again, to make sure there's nobody else out there that you might want to consider if you decide to move ahead and to get public input as, as to whether people think whatever project you're looking at deciding and moving ahead on is a good project for the city. And this is strictly for public infrastructure. So none of this money goes to the developer. Basically, you would get a grant, uh, either your, your engineer through the grant or the developer's engineer would develop plans and specs. You would bid out the project. You would contract for the construction. You, you're, you would basically own it at the end, typically. Uh, typically, it's, it's road work, water line extension, sewer line extension, three-phase power extension, um, natural gas extension if it's needed. So those are the typical kind of things. Uh, if it's stormwater, it's related to the road. It's not stormwater related to his developer's property. So that's the program in a very quick nutshell. If I can answer any questions you might have. Basically, the last one you did was the Lowe's out here, by the way. That was a CDBG economic development grant that, that y'all did for the road work out there and, the, and getting the water and sewer in there. Questions, comments? If you then open it up to public comment. Yeah. At this point, I open this up to the public. Anybody from the public would like to address this grant? Anybody in the public would like to speak to the city council concerning this grant application? Please identify yourself and your address. Yes. Uh, I'm David Smith, uh, 5100 Highway 4, J, Florida. I'm one of the one of six members of a limited liability company uh, that we have formed uh, and uh, project to uh, proceed with this project. Uh, there's six of us; uh, three are here now. Uh, we have uh, we have decided that we would like to try to build an assisted living facility in the Crestview area. Uh, we've been approached by others that there is a need for that. We have a great deal of history in that. We have been working predominantly in our home county of Santa Rosa County. We have built an assisted living facility in Jay, Florida, called the Terrace. It's been a tremendous success. We also operate one in the south end of the county in Gulf Breeze, the watermark of Gulf Breeze. We've had a tremendous amount of success. One of our members have a background here in Okaloosa County in Crestview, and uh, through him and others, we were contacted as to the need in Crestview, and we have looked at it. We're very excited about that, and we have identified this grant, a grant that we also used in Jay, Florida, that really had mutual benefit between our development team and the city of Jay, and we think this grant would be a very mutual benefit to the city of Crestview and to our plans. And we sure hope that uh, you guys will support uh, this grant. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments on the public? Just yes, briefly, my name is Sean Owens, uh, 3578 Highway 4, J, Florida. I am uh, the mayor of J and also the contractor on the project in J, as well as the contractor that will be here in the city of Crestview. Um, as uh, Mr. Smith said, it was a good relationship. It worked out great with the town, and the infrastructure that was put in was needed. Uh, worked out for the developer and the town itself. So it's a good opportunity, and I think it's a, a good working relationship. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, at this point, uh, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. Uh, you know, if, if you want to move ahead with the development of an application, you would need to authorize us to do that. And again, again we would work with the developer. And if this is the development group you want to work with, then we would do that, create basically the application. We would then schedule a second public <laughs> hearing. The ad for that would include a lot of information on the project. And then we would come back to you with, with a public hearing and, and three resolutions if you still want to move ahead and if once those are passed, if that's where you want to go, then we would submit the application to the state on your behalf. All right, thank you. Brian. 
Yes, Mr. Blocker, go ahead. May I ask, sir, what size of facility are you anticipating for how many clients? My name is Frederick Barrett, 4200 Highway 4 East in Jay, Florida, and I'm one of the developers uh, on the project. Um, we, are, we built a 70-bed facility in Jay, Florida, and we t intend to duplicate that project here in Crestview. So it will be a 70-bed facility here in um, Crestview. It is a, um, you're welcome to look at it on, um, on the internet, it's the terrace at Ivy Acres in Jay. It's a luxury facility. It's a very nice facility you'll be extremely proud of to have here in Crestview. I have saw your facility in Jay. Thank you. Yes, sir. But we'll, we'll exceed that here in Crestview. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying we need to expand yes, it? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, we, we may need to consider that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Yes. I have a Go ahead, Mr. Fairclough. Um, how many employees do you anticipate? How many do you have in Jay? We have 30 full-time employees, 30. and so we s intend to duplicate that um, in, in initially. Okay, I don't need you to tell me the exact location, but have you already selected a place? We have purchased property, okay. yes, we have. And um, that is the, the reason, I mean, is it okay to talk about? Um, uh, Again, we don't need to know the location, just that you, you have. Well, I, I think that the project's advanced long enough. That that's the reason that we are here needing the block grant. Um, we're extending Patriots Lane that will come out on Brooksmead. And um, so it will continue. Um, the city already owns the easement, uh, uh, deeded from Dr. Lean. And um, so it will continue the ale and will come out not, not exactly right behind the hospital, but very close. You'll be able to see the back of the hospital, and which will be really to the residents, the elderly's benefit. It's quick access to the emergency room in case of a heart attack or a stroke. It gets them to the emergency room very fast. And so this grant, is, you know, potentially will save lives, you know, and so that's the reason we're really pushing for this. And uh, another thing that I mentioned while I'm here on the, on the city's benefit for this grant is, um, you know, the city only owns the easement. Um, we're actually giving, you know, we paid a lot of money for 7.3 acres, and we are, we'll, we'll be deeding our land to the city for a holding pond that the EPA at all is demanding that it that you have to have to hold water for the road. And so we're deeding the city land for basically for free for the road, you know. So it's look, it's like a good marriage, you know. We're, we're, <laughs> we're working with the city, and I want you to know that it's been a great working relationship. I've been working on the project really for how long, Dr. Smith? About three years now, but really intensely for about a year or no. Uh, you know, I've been working closely with, with your staff, and they have been a dream to work with, uh, City of Crestview. I, I used to live in, in the City of Crestview, and um, uh, at City of Crestview has been very, very generous to us, well to work with. And so I think it's just been a, a – it's starting to be a good marriage, and so uh, I hope you approve it, and I appreciate your time. Mr. Hawley, if I, if I could ask your opinion on this. Uh, uh, what I'm hearing is, is there's a clawback uh, condition in there. If we did not generate X number of jobs, then we would have to repay part of the grant, all of the grant or whatever. I heard some of that, but I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, so I can't tell you. Yeah, basically, if, uh, you know, if they committed, say, to 30 jobs, which is the number I just heard, and then they committed and they only created 28, then, then you'd be on the hook to pay back 30, basically 35,000 times two, 70 grand. Um, and the way to protect you is to develop what we call a developer's agreement, which is actually an agreement between the city and them. And, and with that, you either require they put up a, a line of credit from their lender or a bond, for, basically from the time you start expending funds out of the grant through the time that the state administratively closes out the grant. And basically, there's two thresholds. There's the threshold of the 34999, that's the most you can request per job being created. 
but per, per job, per, jo per, per full-time equivalent job. Yeah. Um, so basically, if they have two 20-hour people, that's one full-time equivalent. 40 hours a week is considered full-time. Um, and from when the infrastructure is signed off on by the engineer, we still have to wait a year, even if the job's created in the next two or three months, unless we get down below $10,000 per job, which we're not going to get to. You have to keep the grant open for an extra year so that if anybody came, come, else comes up and wants to hook into that water, sewer, utilize the road, whatever, then they would have to also look at their, we look at their jobs. Now after the year, none of that's required, but it's a year after the infrastructure is in place <coughs> and that's when the grant would be administratively closed out. There's maybe it's quite a bit of liability. I don't know what the cost of a bond just would be on that. Well, again, the developer would be responsible for that. And you don't, you don't start expending any of the grant funds until that bond is in place. You, the reason we do is a separate agreement rather than the one from DEO. DEO has a timeline on theirs. And obviously when you're talking about putting up uh, you know, uh, funds in escrow or, or lines of credit, that, that, that negotiation takes longer in many cases than the deadlines DEO has for their participating party agreement. And that's why we, develop, we recommend the developer's agreement be a separate agreement. Just to give you some background, we've done about, I've done about 35 of these. We just finished two Loves facilities. One was uh, in Hawthorne, Florida. The other one was down uh, just above Moorhaven. We just finished an assisted living facility in St. John's County. That's a first class place um, <coughs> that the, the county's getting ready to submit the close out. We've got a hotel project that is finally came to fruition literally last Friday. Um, and we're, we're working on a big rail spur project over in Suwannee County for a very large lumber mill that's currently under construction. Not the lumber mills there are operational, the rail spur is under construction. So, I mean, we'll work with Mr. Holly. And again, if, if, if you can't come to an agreement on your developer's agreement, then the whole thing falls apart. Okay. I, I see the benefit of the program. I just want to make sure we're protecting the city, that's all. Go ahead, Mr. Chair Clark. I have one question before you sit down. <laughs> sure. um, this um, fourth category, economic development. And that's what we're talking about, yes, sir. It said business must create new long-term jobs. Long-term jobs, is that in perpetuity or is that? No, basic, no basically what we're going to, again, there's going to be a two-page form that I require they have each employee fill out, new employee. And then they're going to provide me a payroll roster from a moment in time of their choice. And, it's going to, and then I'm going to need that two-page form on each of those employees on that payroll roster. And I'm going to look at the hours they worked on that payroll roster to make sure that we document the correct number of hours. And then I'll double check that at least 51% of the people in those jobs when they filled out the form were from low moderate income households. Uh, that's a one-time thing. Now at the end of the year, typically, DEO will come out and make sure they're still in operation. But they will, we don't have to go back and, and basically justify the jobs a second time. And what at the end of that year, the grant's closed out and you're done. What protects the city if they don't get the jobs? That developer's agreement. Any other comments, questions? That's, uh, Mr. Holly, that's why you want either a line, lend, line of credit from their lender or a bond, something that you can collect on easily. You be in the city, not you personally. So. Well, you're, I assume you're familiar with this, agree, this type of agreement anyway. Yeah, we can provide you some samples. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll say one last thing. Go ahead. So you're familiar ahead. With, with what we did um, when the group built the facility in Jay in reference to the liability of what's going on. There's no liability for say on the construction side of this project because when it, you know, upon completion of the infrastructure is how that pays out. The liability is the job creation. Right. That job creation, you're only liable for what they don't produce. 
So if they said they were going to do 30 jobs and they, and they only had 28, then that bond is there for those two jobs that they missed. Now, I've never seen it happen before uh, with experience with these grants. I mean, it, obviously it could happen, but it's very unlikely that it will, especially when you're talking about the, the amount of money that's invested in these projects. Nobody's going to invest seven to ten million dollars and not try to create through a, a small six or seven hundred thousand dollar grant and not produce the type of jobs that you're looking for. So I think it's a safer bet. The bond is definitely probably if you're going to go that route, probably a little easier for everybody. But um, it's, it's only liability from the side of the jobs they don't create. And they're going to be very conservative when it comes to what jobs are going to produce. I know with our experience in the town, town of Jay, if I change hats and use the, the, the municipality side, you know, we were very uh, um, obviously concerned about how this works, but it was such an easy process. It went through fine and uh, just no issues at all. So there's a lot of protection with these agreements that Mr. Fox is talking about. Um, and they're just not going to invest this amount of money for a couple of jobs not to be created. They'll be more conservative than than most, I'm sure, with my experience with these developers. So, just wanted you to know that. Uh, you, the, the bond would have to be for uh, about the jobs, but it's for the other what we started talking about in the first bond place. If they don't get, it's not going to just cover the jobs. Is it? You're going to okay. There's going to be a payment and performance bond you're going to require from your contractor that's building the road improvements. The water, that's the typical bond that you'd have on any construction job. This is the second bond. This is the one the developers got to put up to guarantee. And again, he's right. If, if you just are short a couple of jobs, you have to pay back 34,999 times the number of jobs you're short. But if you got through and inadvertently you hadn't hired 51% low moderate income, that could, that could trigger a full payback. But so you, you, it's not. A, I mean, it's a possibility. Well, I've never had it happen. Bond that secures that they build it. That's what I'm getting at. You got to have more than one bond, not just people working there. Well, again, you're going to have a bond through your your contractor that is going to do the, the physical improvements for the road and the water and sewer, and that'll be a payment and performance bond, and that's required by the, the federal government and the state. And then the developer, in our recommendation. Although DE does, DEO doesn't require it, they certainly support it, uh, would be a bond from these guys to make sure if they don't meet their end of the commitment. And I mean, you. you That's it, what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. I then then either, a, and if you're not comfortable with a bond, you could require that it be a letter of credit from the lender. I mean, that's sort of your call. Yeah, but I think we need the protection of a bond that they go through with what they're supposed to. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think, Mr. Holly, you're, you're more talking about in reference to them doing the project itself, yeah. meaning you want to get so far along on the infrastructure of this grant and then turn around and the developers not even do the project. Yeah. I see what you're saying. And I think that's, a, that's an easy, you know, agreement between the city and the developers uh, well, then, through that process. Really that, would be, that would be part of the bond yeah. that you would get with the developers. They just walked away from it. Or even if, you know, the, they're in a plane and it crashes and they're not around anymore, that bond would need to be there to protect the city. So it's not only for the jobs, it's also if the whole deal fell apart after you would put in the infrastructure. Well, that was my whole point. It's not yeah. just for the jobs, it's for the make sure they go through. Typically, the, the construction of both the infrastructure and then the, on the construction on the private side is going to go on simultaneously. So while, we're, while the city is doing the roads and the water and the sewer, they're going to be developing their property and building their building as well. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mr. Fairclough. I'm curious, uh, Mr. Mayor. The um, they said 30 employees uh, intended. Yes, sir. I think that for uh, 70 it, residents. it'll it'll be depending on uh, the numbers of the infrastructure itself because that's what will make most of the sense. Anywhere between 24 and 30 jobs well, will be what, dependent. What I'm thinking is. And I'm very concerned with this because I may be a resident. You know, <laughs> um, you got some. Some of those 30 are going to be admin. Some of them are going to be food service. Some of them are going to be maintenance. I want to know exactly how many people are going to be taking care of the residents. What the national average and ratio that would be, or is each one of those uh, staff members and they've got to have three shifts. So now you're cutting it by a third. So 
is uh, the staff members going to wind up with 15, 20 uh, residents each? Or have yeah, and I, I think probably Frederick can answer that, but it's a state requirement that you have so many employees. Right. And he can probably tell you a lot more information on that. We'll be, as far as the state requirement, we uh, both facilities that we own now, we are over overstaffed. We make sure that we have more the employees on the floor than what the state actually requires. So uh, we don't we don't put it under staff and have one guy around there tending to a bunch of residents. So um, uh, this is assisted living facility. You have three phases when you're taking care of the elderly. You have independent living, assisted living, and then you have skilled care. Some people call it nursing home. Some people call it a rehab unit. And so this will this is assisted living. This is a step down from that. So they assist with the activities of daily living. Some people call it ADLs. And so they can still get in their car and leave. And you know, they can still they they can assist with the activities of daily living. So they're not don't they don't need total care. So when you step up to um, a skill care, that's total care. So you have you may have twice as many employees in a skilled care than you do in an assisted living facility. Is that going to be part of your 30s? Uh, well, I understand. We're not a skilled care. We are, we are in an assisted living facility, okay? So we're, we're not in a skilled well, care. I, thought you, I, thought, I understood you say there were three levels at this side. No, 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 no. We are strictly assisted living. Okay. We are strictly assisted living. Okay. okay. We're not independent living, and we are not uh, a skilled care. We are strictly assisted living. 70 uh, li we're going to be licensed for 70 beds and and we may and we may only have we're licensed for 70 beds in in J and and we we may only have 60 residents there now okay but we're licensed for 70 in case we have a bunch of couples come in we uh, we'll have enough space because uh, we can't take over the license amount of people there okay so uh, we may only have 57 rooms in the facility but we're licensed for 70 beds Okay, and so uh, so whereas we have um, 57 rooms and everybody takes one room, we only may have 57 residents there with 30 full-time employees. You see what I'm saying? Um, but one thing's for sure, I, I used to inspect assisted living facilities and, and I know the, the, the regulatory end. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we're right. And we want to make sure that when we walk in, when the state walks in the facility, they are not going to find anything, find us shortchanging, uh, you know, the residents, the employees. Um, and part of our success is, is this is the best team uh, anywhere. We work with FALA, we work with ACA, and they're wanting us to buy as many assisted livings in the state of Florida as possible because we're the ethical. Uh, we, we, run, we know how to run them. And um, corporate world is trying to take over assisted livings right now because it's such a great business. Uh, but we're whipping the corporate world's rear end because we, we know the business and we know how to run it. We have physicians on staff. We have a CPA. We have an awesome business manager that owns a pharmacy and, and um, DME business. And, uh, and I'm on the regulatory end. We're just very well balanced. And, um, you know, we, we put our heads together. We can whip anybody. And so we, we, just, we just know how to, we just know how to um, get into an assisted living facility and run it very well. So coming into Crestview, uh, we're going to be very, very hard to beat. We're going to, you know, you're going to want us to open up another facility, another facility in Crestview when we get, when we open up a facility. You're going to be very, very impressed. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think we need to focus on on the, whether we want to go forward with the grant rather than operation of the, of the facility. So, <clears throat> so if I could have action by the council, please. Mr. President. Yes, Ms. Cox. I move to approve the CDBG grant application. Mr. President, so second. I have a motion to second to move to approve the the yeah, CDBG so grant we'll application. The development of the application, because again, we will be coming back to you with a second public hearing. We'll, we'll get into much more detail on the project itself. Right. I'll I'll you the resolution will be at the next meeting. I'm just looking for oh, a motion today to either move forward or not move forward with the development of the application. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do right now. Okay, motion is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? 
Well, it carries four to zero with one half. Thank you all for your for your time. This time, is there anybody in the audience who would like to uh, address the city council on any topic that's on our agenda tonight? Anybody in the audience like to address us on any agenda item? Okay, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, do I have the understanding that 9C was removed? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. If I could have uh, action on the consent agenda, then please. Red. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Blocker. I move to approve consent agenda items A, B, E, F, and G. And D. D. And D. <laughs> but I don't have a D on mine. Second. I have a motion a second to approve consent agenda A, B, D, E, F, and G. Yes. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So it carries four to zero with one after. Okay, we move on to item 10, resolutions. Resolution 18-23, uh, home rule. Do you agree that, uh, Madam Clerk? Sir. Resolution 18-23 reads by title, Celebrating 50 Years of Home Rule, a resolution of the City of Crestview, Florida, honoring 50 years of municipal home rule on the Florida Constitution and committing to an educational initiative to help Florida Floridians understand this beneficial right. This is Resolution 18-23. Anybody have any objections to that? Pass unanimously. Resolution 18-24. Madam Clerk. Resolution 18-24 reads by title, a resolution by the City Council of Crestview, Florida, recognizing Florida City Government Week, October 22nd through 28th, 2018, and encouraging all citizens to support the, the celebration and corresponding activities and providing for an effective date. This is Resolution 18-14. Any objection to that resolution? Unanimous consent passes. Vote is zero. Many reports we have not listed. Schedule presentation from the public. Presentation of track it by Superion. Well, last time we were here, last uh, two months ago in June, we talked about the benefits that are going to be realized by moving forward with this product across the different departments. And you had asked me to come back and kind of talk about the return on investment that we see across our product. So what I did is I took some numbers that we've had from agencies that we've worked with across the state and then working with Mr. Bilby, I worked with them to use those same metrics based off of the volume of inspections that you have and things of that nature. Um, with that being said, with the mobile inspections in the field, this is going to allow people to not be duplicating work. Excuse me, Jason, let me show this. Gentlemen, you're looking for that page right there. Uh -oh. Thank you. It's the last page in the security Excuse Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Probably a lot more helpful that way if you just look at it as I talk about it. So I tracked to talk about that. That's the mobile inspection capability in the field for both code enforcement officers and building inspections. The main benefit of this is you're not duplicating work, documentation, picture taking out of the field, coming back into the office and putting that information into the tracking system as well as uploading pictures. As you can see here, this can save three to five minutes per inspection results. When you look at that over annually, you're looking at about 400 hours of labor saved in one year. E-Track of the forward-facing citizen access portal. We have agencies that are allowing for up to 40% of their permits to come online. This, this cuts down on staff time at the counter, helping them walk through these different applications, as well as staff time at the counter as they're bringing up new documentation based on new information and or plan sets that are needed. By moving forward with E-Track, this can also save roughly 400 to 500 hours 
annually. And again, looking at that, each average uh, counter intake is about 10, 15 minutes, and that's just on initial intake that doesn't come back if they're coming in and looking at a plan resubmittal or have questions or want to talk to um, whoever was that had their comments on their building plans. And then last would be the electronic plan review. Um, by looking at this, you can save the average of roughly 30 minutes per plan review by not duplicating efforts and doing manual comparison. Again, this one's going to be a huge time saving of roughly 1,500 hours um, over the course of the year. So when you look at what you're saving annually based off what you're investing in here, you're looking at breaking even in year three or four using rough numbers and averages that we've experienced across the state. So if you have any questions on anything we talked about last time, some follow-up or anything yeah, specific on that? Comments, questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Blocker. How long has this organization been in existence? Um, the one, 25 years, This product, the product that you're looking at has been around. The organization has been around for 40 plus years. Do we have any neighbors that is a client of yours? Yes. Would you be liable to? Yeah, Tell we've provided something. we've provided some references. There's also a list of some of those. Um, if you fold back a couple sheets, Lakeland, this one here, some of the Florida yeah. clients, and then we've also listed some references. You listed Fort Walton Beach as one of your clients. Yep, it's on here as well. Fort Walton Beach is out of the country to us. <laughs> <laughs> we got big. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Cox, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Parnell, I just want to thank you for uh, addressing the questions that I had on the first uh, first go round. Uh, you've answered everything I was looking for. So appreciate the acknowledgement. Madam Clark, go ahead. Um, I know this is a, a superior product, and that's what we have as our system from the financial aspect of this, this will be fully accessible for financials transferring over just like the old Superior products so we can do reports, send our stuff in. Correct. And that's also a benefit of already owning one of our products that we have that's an analytics now tool. Right. So that you'll be able to use what you're currently using in your track it packages will fold right into that. But so I mean, just, just the basic day-to-day -day financial stuff will still transfer yep. over to the regular Correct. Superior products. Correct. That's all I need to know. I would just add that uh, I spent some time with Mr. Bilby after the last meeting and, uh, and Ms. Galen, and, uh, and it just seems to me like that's maybe not even the future. We should be there already. That everybody else is converting to this type of system, and we're going to be left behind if we don't do this. And the other thing that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Teresa, but I believe that in this year's building budget, they would be able to... Uh, budget the whole program at one time they were saying up to three hundred and seven three hundred eight thousand dollars they would be able to do a hunk of it and we'd come up with some and mm -hmm. talking to jonathan he believed they could fund it completely out of the building uh, fund. correct Is that correct correct that's uh one of the attributes here uh that uh, the cloud hosting annual first year annual access is uh eighty two thousand and your um, development, your bloom beam, your installation, your configuration, your technical services, consulting, training, and project management all runs about uh, 226000 But this is, uh, as you know, the uh, building uh, and inspection is totally self-sufficient, and they have saved for a number of years, and they do have the funds to fund uh, the first year uh, cloud as well as the technical <clears throat> installation which will total three hundred eight thousand four hundred eighty four dollars and and refresh my mind is this a, a two-year phase in was it I, it's it not instantaneous of, obviously no 10 to 14 months from project kickoff to implementation so there's a lot that goes into that a lot of um, oh, sure, yeah. processes looked at why we're doing things a certain way and leaning on best of approaches not only for our software but how other so agencies in a year and a half maybe huh Closer to that, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Flocker. In so a couple of years, 18 months, what is the forthcoming annually fee? Or is there an annually fee? It's listed yes, sir. Annual Your annual access fee, that's the party 82. that uh, is the cloud service, which is uh, car will run at 82,000. Um, 
We currently run 17,000, and that actually includes the uh, the uh, business tax receipt and the uh, other which was in that figure. That's a couple of thousand that if they're not going to be part of it, that will drop out. Uh, the building and inspections will cover 50% of that, and the remainder will of the um, 42, I'm sorry, 41,000 uh, will be uh, cause an increase for the city for nearly 25,000, which is like 24, 8, 10 would be the increase in the yearly uh, access for that. What well, my concern is, what would we project five, ten years from now? Hundred thousand? Mm. I was actually talking with uh, Miss Gillard earlier today, and it's my understanding that the city only wants to look at a one-year agreement. If you guys wanted to project okay. forward, we'd be happy to do that. And in the business that we're in, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us to spend two hundred fifteen thousand dollars and then not decide to redo that contract for the second year. Does that make sense? If you you're spending eighteen months setting up and configuring this to decide not to move forward with the same software in year three means that you'd be looking at something else and incurring another implementation cost of roughly a quarter million dollars. So that's my concern. Right. right. So we typically like to see agreements for three to five years. And again, that ties in with where we think agencies are breaking even. So it makes sense for them. Also, you can project it. Um, we'd also encourage to lock in that rate for five years, depending on what would happen. Okay. And then you can lock in. Typically, it's three, you can lock uh, three it percent in. or CPI. Yeah, we're happy to negotiate. By all means. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Any other questions, comments? Okay, can I have action, please? Mr. President. Go ahead, Ms. Cox. I move to approve the request to purchase of the Track It Data Management System by the Building and Inspection Section of the Growth Management Department in the amount of $308,484. Mr. President, so second. Got a motion second. To approve the request to purchase the track data management system by the building inspection section of the growth management department in the amount of $308,484. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Vote carries 4 to 0, 1 absent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And finally. <laughs> All the way from the county. Jason Autry. I, I crossed the river this morning to get here, but I was here before I came to the meeting, so <laughs> not quite from a different country. Uh, Jason Autry, Director of Public Works for Okaloosa County. Uh, we're here this evening at the request of, of Councilman Cox to kind of give you an update on the PG Adams Parkway project. I have me, with me the county engineer, Scott, Bitter, Scott Bitterman, who's running this project, and he's going to give you the presentation. Uh, but while I was here, I just wanted to kind of, get a, kind of give you a quick overview of the two really major projects that we have going on in the, in the Crestview area. Obviously, P.J. Adams Parkway, the widening of itself, which you'll get a picture of that here shortly. You'll notice the title says the Southwest Crestview Bypass. It's more than just P.J. Adams now. We're actually looking at going around the entire southwest corner of Crestview. Uh, we're very optimistic on how we can get that funded and moving forward. Uh, and then the other one, as you've seen, I'm sure as you drove in recently, is the Crestview Courthouse, the courthouse in Okaloosa County. Uh, I'm happy to say that the contractor met the contract deadline of July 31st for getting a temporary certificate of occupancy. Uh, you'll see there's a lot still to be done out there. Uh, they've paved the parking lot. They've got some landscaping to do. We're still, the county's working on some stormwater elements that ties to a city property. Uh, and we're finishing up the stuff on the inside. You'll see a public information release in the very near future. Uh, we have a grand opening scheduled for November 16th. It's out a little bit, and one of the oddball parts of that facility is the security. Uh, you can't test the security while you're building the building and while workers are in there touching up, and so there's a very long, what we call a break-in, which is an ironic term to use in a courthouse, but it's a lead-in period. Um, and uh, court functions will begin tentatively. Court administration is looking to have that operation back in place December 1 of this year. So it gives a little bit of time over Thanksgiving to move in uh, as well. We're very excited about it. I'm getting really close to the point where I'm going to shut the doors and not let anybody, let anybody go into it until the grand opening. That was kind of a big reveal. Uh, but it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful facility. Uh, Mr. Steele and I had a chance to meet and go over some site issues the other day, and I took him through there, and I think he was quite impressed with what we have. So we're very excited with what we're doing, not only in downtown Crestview, but in the Crestview area itself with P.J. Adams Parkway. Uh, with that, I'm going to let Mr. Bitterman speak to the project specifics, or if you have any other questions. Yeah, before we leave, Jason, sure. uh, on the courthouse, because I kind of lost 
uh, track what we were doing here. We were trying to eliminate the retention ponds and come up with a different sure. drainage system. How did that, how did that end up? Uh, we eliminated the ponds and came up with a different drainage system. <laughs> okay. it, yeah, uh, what had happened was there was, uh, when you redevelop sites, over 50% of the site redevelop, which clearly that was, the requirement is you have to have stormwater infrastructure in place for the new stuff. So to use round numbers, if we had a 60,000 square foot facility and we put in 70,000 square foot, we had to account for the additional 10,000 square foot. That was what the ponds were that was designed. What's unique about the downtown Crestview area is that the drainage system all collects and goes to one of a couple locations. Well, where that pond, where those pipes go to is actually the stormwater ponds that are a little bit west of there and down the hill. And what we did was we worked with the water management district and said, hey, listen, instead of us putting ponds in the front of our in the front yard of our new courthouse, what we'd like to do is go and take that facility that is overgrown, lacks maintenance, and actually was without a permit. And we'll go ahead and bring it up to standard. The trade-off for them is we now have a permit associated with the facility, so they can always come back to the city in this case and say, hey, listen, we need to get this restored back to the permitted conditions. Uh, the trade for the good news for you guys is, is we're going to build it to that condition. So it's going to be an improvement for drainage flow, it's an improvement for erosion control, and it gets rid of the ponds in front of the courthouse. So that's how we get over their objections, because I remember originally they objected to it. But that is correct. Redeveloping the, the, pond. the natural attraction for development is to put everything on the parcel. The problem with this parcel is we've got everything and then some already out there. And so for us to be able to, to remove those ponds and have a lawn, truly a lawn in the front yard of the courthouse is, is a huge step forward. Yeah, it was, it was, a, great, it was a great job that uh, I got to give Scott a lot of credit for working with the Water Management District on finding a way that we can do this. And uh, it's something we're moving forward on. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Bitterman to present, if there's any questions we're done, I'll be happy to answer them. My name again is Scott Bitterman. I'm your county engineer. And I've got just a real short presentation for you on the Southwestern Crestview Bypass. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, it's been a while since uh, I've been before you, but this, the uh, bypass includes portions of PJ Adams Parkway. It's a two lane roadway today. You can see the typical section for the roadway. Uh, it'd be a four lane roadway with a median, bike lanes, and it'll have sidewalks. On both sides of the roads in most places, some places only one side if it's through a wetland. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, the joint Triumph application that the uh, county and the city have worked on together. You can see down there, uh, PJ Adams Parkway phases one, two, three, and four. And then in green is the interchange phase that uh, FDOT's working on. And then we've also got the uh, phase five, where the city and uh, the county are working on Raspberry Road and the southwestern bypass on up to Highway 90. So we're getting close to construction on the first three phases. Next slide, please. Uh, the design and the right-of-way acquisition for the first three phases is complete. Uh, what we've got next uh, is the Army Corps approval of the mitigation. And uh, you know, originally when we started a couple of years ago, um, getting with the right-of-way acquisition, we thought the right-of-way would probably be the longest uh, lead time uh, item that we had. But it turns out the Army Corps permit has taken a lot longer than we originally, <clears throat> originally anticipated. So we've got a mitigation package before them. Um, we've got a piece of property identified that costs $212,000 that we're currently looking at. Uh, if and when they do approve that, then we would get a conservation easement on top of that piece of property. Then we would bid the project. Uh, the estimated construction cost is $9.5 million for phase one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Then we would do contract approval and finally construction. So what I'm getting at with those bullet points is once we get the approval from the Army Corps, we're looking at four to five months down the road before actual construction takes place. So. Uh, Army Corps says go. If they would say go today, we would be under construction probably in January. If uh, the Army Corps takes a few more months, it just pushes everything a few more months down the road. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide. It it's just shows, um, I've talked a lot about the Army Corps mitigation, the wetland impacts. On the lower left hand of the screen, you can see three black ovals. And those are the areas where uh, you can see they're over the green areas. Those are the wetlands that the PJ Adams project is impacting. So when we impact those wetlands, 
Uh, the Army Corps wants to say, hey, you need to protect the environment somewhere else, uh, do something else so that we can improve the water quality. And then that large black oval on the upper right hand, that's the piece of property that we have before the Army Corps right now, and they're deciding if that is an acceptable uh, mitigation for them, and that's about 100 acres. And we already have a, uh, a purchase agreement with the property owner, so hopefully the Army Corps uh, will uh, approve the mitigation soon and we can get going. I'll be glad to answer any other questions you might have. Mr. Fox, okay. go ahead. Aside from the uh, Corps of Engineer mitigation uh, issue, uh, back on uh, segments one, two, and three, mm -hmm. uh, can I have some assurances that, because in, initially before we were looking at tri, potentially triumph funds for much lo larger project, uh, that those first segments were gonna be done and it was going to be constructed as funds became available. Sure. But uh, sections one, two, and three are fully funded, and is F. Dot Trip program, and I was concerned that you did a two-year contract extension on the on that program with F. Dot, and I just want to make sure it's uh, that with the potential of triumph funds that that the initial segments won't be delayed because of that you're yeah. absolutely correct the the triumph funds um, if those do in fact come forward we'll start working on that portion as well finishing the design and getting those projects ready to go but phases one two and three of pj adams the only thing that we're waiting on is the army corps permit and once we get that a lot of the other uh, dominoes will fall right into place and will be under construction, like I said, four to five months after they give us the approval. Okay, but uh, that puts us into sometime in 2019? Um, yeah, we're looking at Jan. If they would approve it now, we're looking at January. So if they approve it next That's month, it will be February. So, okay. yep. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Blocker. Go back to slide one. Yes, sir. On that 22-foot medium, mm -hmm. is there going to be any buffer in that medium, or is it going to be a landscape, or is there any consideration for irrigation or anything in that? What is going to be in that medium? It would mostly be grass, and in a lot of places, that median will actually be a turn lane. So if we're at one of the traffic signals, it won't be 22-foot wide. So if you're uh, one of the intersections, it'll be much skinnier. But, yeah, there will be portions where it's wider, and... Um, it'll just be grassed as what we initially plan to construct. And that the element catches that water if we get a rain. If not, I think we're getting plenty we of rain. rain. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't been a problem lately. Yeah, the median won't need a sprinkler. That's system. right. Uh, I want to ask you about one big domino. Okay. <laughs> and that is, uh, do we have any any idea where FDOT is? You know, we asked them during that workshop to incorporate the interchange in the five-year plan and magically come up with $96 million. Are we getting any feedback from them where, where we are? Uh, I've, I've heard quite a bit of noise um, from that, uh, that line of thinking because uh, what I failed to mention, there's, there's other things that we're applying for. For instance, phase four, even though we've applied for phase four for Triumph funding, uh, the county also applied to um, the Federal Highway Administration for what's called a build grant. So that's about $8 million worth. So if Triumph um, wouldn't come through for some reason, we've got another funding source we're pursuing for that. FDOT has also or applied for a build grant for the interchange. So that would be about $25 million that FDOT's trying to secure for the interchange project. So it is uh, very much on their radar. Uh, they, they haven't guaranteed that the funds will be there yet, but I know that, you know, uh, if, if, like Jason said, we, we looked at it uh, years ago and they said, you know, you get the roadways up to I-10 and FDOT will meet us there with an interchange. So that's the plan. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's kind of the, the, the deal we've had. You're absolutely correct. If you look at their five-year plan, you will not see the interchange in there. Uh, but uh, we are working very closely with the state, not only on the Triumph application, but on the PJ Adams Parkway project. The success of getting PJ widened, getting it to the interstate and having an interchange, 
is to help 85. That's a state facility. That's the reason they're participating in this game. They are going to find a way to get that interchange funded. Uh, that is just the best I can put it. It's not on their plan, but they understand the importance of getting it done to the community. Do you want me to bring up the, the topic you, that I talked to you about privately? Feel is, free. Is that, <laughs> is that still on the radar, those, those Remind roundabouts? Remind me which. Uh, the roundabouts. <laughs> it's still in the, 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 that's in phase four. Um, yeah. That has been shown on the PD&E. Uh, I, I, that is concept only at this point. Um, I think once the state gets further along in their PD&E for the interchange, uh, we will see how those lay out. I, I'm not convinced that they will be there. Well, I hope not. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. And, and again, from the county's perspective, we want to thank the cooperation with the city of Crestview. I know it's been talked about. We had that meeting a couple months back with the various stakeholders involved, and um, I think that's a good sign of progress that we're making, and we're excited to see what's coming forward in this in, the, in this area. Mr. Cox, you have a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, one thing back on segments one, two, and three. I like what you say there. But um, so we're down to um, uh, mitigation with Corps of Engineers. Is, is there anything that the city or city officials uh, get, so can do without one the, upsetting uh, One of the great fallacies in, in the world is that, that governments, counties or cities can get permits faster from <laughs> federal regulatories. Tim, back here with the city of Fort laughs because he knows that just doesn't happen that way. <laughs> um, the, unfortunately, working through the core, you are on their schedule. Uh, we had a very interesting situation where in this portion of the county or state for that matter We didn't have mitigation banks that were available uh, That is actually changing very soon. So we kind of have an option of another route We may be able to go we are pressuring their regional office with daily calls and we are pressuring their legal office This really boils down to mineral rights on this one parcel is what it comes down to it's um, it's actually inconsequential to the project, but it matters a lot from the legal perspective and from the Corps uh, granting of this as a, as a conservation easement. I don't know of anything more that can be done by you or anybody else. Uh, we are applying as much pressure as we possibly can, and uh, I'm confident we're going to get through this in, in relatively short order. Um, I say that, but they've had this application since March, so I don't want there to be the thought that the county delayed in getting this to them. They've had it for six months, and, um, and this is just typical working with the federal agencies. We will get there, though. I will tell you, five years ago, I would not have stood here and thought for one second that we were going to get this road four lane up to Wild Horse from 85. And I stand here confident that we're going to turn dirt in within the year, within a year, you know, beginning of January, beginning of next year. I, it's coming. It is coming. He just answered my last question. Okay, good. Uh, no. One year. One, one we'll one. start. We ain't going to finish it that fast, but we'll start. <laughs> one more thing. Uh, would. Uh, you be revising the TPO uh, spreadsheets we still will, show construction? We will, yeah, we will not, but that will be done by the West Florida Regional Planning Council. As projects move forward, they do that as they make their updates. That is correct. The county doesn't. So, we don't. We don't set that so schedule. That, the planning Council does. That can be discussed uh, Thurs at Thursday's sure. meeting. Yep. 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 Yeah. As those projects move forward, they fall off and cycle through. Does. Mr. Yes, go ahead, Mr. <clears throat> Does uh, phase five go all the way to 90? Yes, sir. What it follows uh, by and large is the PD&E that was performed by the county back in 2004 range, I believe it was, maybe a little bit, late, a little bit after that. Um, but it goes up arena, comes out Inzer, and it lines up with Old Bethel Road. The application that was submitted for the Triumph Grant uh, includes Raspberry Road, which is the east-west north of the interstate, which we believe is a huge element for success. Uh, and then it also connects up to 90. Um, we are actively now, we actually just uh, issued a task order to one of our consultants to begin that process. One of the concerns that I have is that if I do get $64 million from Triumph and we do get sales tax money to move forward on this project, this wonderful staff of two can't handle that kind of project on our own. The other thing I don't want to do is be caught um, with the starting gun fired off and we're still putting our track shoes on. So we're meeting up with consultants now to serve as project managers to 
move this project forward in advance of getting funds released to us. What I would love to see is that we construct phases one, two, and three. While we're constructing that, we're designing for the interchange and we're doing phase five up there. Once we finish up with the first portion of it, then we go right into construction on the second portion of it. Um, there will be a lot of moving parts that have to get aligned before we can accomplish that. But when you're talking the opportunity to spend $200 million to put a bypass around the southwest portion of the county seat, I think it's an effort that's worth moving forward on. Have, have you uh, really um, started dreaming and put in a phase six, a phase six on Old Bethel? So we have an agreement with the Department of Transportation in 2020 or 2019? It's 2021. Maybe 2021 to do the study to, to do an analysis of our pd &E over there. That was a requirement in order for the interchange to meet um, its rationale to justify it. I, I don't know how to explain that in short words, but that is an agreement to look at that dream. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much. This time I'll uh, begin a <coughs> Councilman Faircloth. Do you have any uh, input this evening? Um, <coughs> <clears throat> I don't think so, not at this time. Okay. Want some blocker? I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> okay. Time out for a drink. Yeah. First and foremost, I want to say this. In behalf of that, I've had several people <clears throat> that asked me to thank the mayor <clears throat> for and commend him for the <clears throat> taking the task that he did. Correcting the problem of the police department. Amen. Well needed. And I want to say well done, and I thank you for that. And I, this time I would also like to alert my fellow council people here that we tune our antennas to every department of this city, bring every department under our radar, and if we find there's a bad apple in the basket, let's get it out. Let's be transparent. Let's give these people of Crestview the service they deserve and show them what a great city Crestview, Florida is. Thank you. Councilman Cox. Uh, yes, one item. Uh, and I forgot to bring my documentation. But I uh, uh, recently read in the last two weeks a uh, statistic that shows that the Crestview, Fort Walton Beach, Destin, MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area is number 18 in the U.S. this year, or the last year, excuse me, as fastest growing in U.S., moved up from 23 to 18. Thank you. The only thing I have, uh, did, did each of you get that uh, email concerning the TPO input about... Uh, uh, Six Lady Mary Esther. Did you get that email? I saw it sent to me. I don't know if y'all got it. I, I because if not, I won't be at the TPO meeting uh, this month, and I want to make sure if you didn't get it, I brought a copy. I have. Right. Now, uh, are you still you still going to convention and going no, to TPO? I'm going to TPO. You're going to TPO. You're going TPO. TPO. All right, I'm going to convention. Uh, I just want to make sure y'all get that email too. Yes. So yeah. if you want to bring it up or whatever. Okay, uh, let's move on to 14A, Discussion of City Government Week, October 22nd to the 28th, 2018. And let's see if I can find where we are on that thing. On tab. 14A. 13. 14A. 14, 14, 8. 14A. Got two different things there. Yeah, what we were supposed to do was to bring back any recommendations either to go forward with kind of what we did last year or to modify that or change it or, or whatever. We decided we want to do something. Uh, and I'm not sure those dates are the same as they were last year. It's you know what the date? It's, it's the, the 22nd. Week, 22nd. This, but this is what just what Yeah, this for last year. 22nd to the 26th. Right. And... Um, so I'd like your thoughts on uh, what we should do for City Government Week. Then I'll give you my thoughts afterwards. Any 
Any thoughts on what we should do? I enjoyed serving at uh, Hub City Smokehouse. I did too. I didn't get any tips. But <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got one tip. I enjoyed your serving. <laughs> I got one tip. Don't come back. I'm, I'm sure Mike would let us do it again. Huh? I'm sure he would let us do it again. We can. Okay, so uh, you think that was a good, that was a Friday, Friday afternoon or Friday evening project that worked out well. Um, I will tell you that here are my thoughts on the uh, open house. Uh, that did not go well last year. Uh, thank God for a little Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts because they showed up uh, as our only uh, people that showed up last year. Uh, but we already know that we're going to have visitors from the sister cities, Normoutier, because the mayor's going to be here uh, to receive the proclamation. And my guess is the, uh, all of the chaperones will show up, which they bring in six adults and their sponsors, because every, everybody that comes here from France is going to have a sponsor too. So we're going to have probably a dozen people just from uh, sister cities. Uh, I'm working with uh, Mr. Day at the school uh, last year. We couldn't pull it off getting the student government here because they changed uh, sponsors in the middle of everything. But I've already contacted him, and of course they just went back to school today, and someone's supposed to contact me uh, to get student government involved. Now, if we get the student government, they have 20 to 25 students there. So I'm thinking if this thing grows the way I would like to see it grow, that people will actually show up, we might want to consider moving it to Warriors Hall right, and okay. setting up tables on the side because right now if you ask a bunch of people to go to the mayor's office, they get claustrophobic because you couldn't put, you know, 10 people in there, you know. We had trouble getting two Boy Scouts in there. <laughs> so uh, if we would consider looking at Warriors Hall and we could put a tables along the wall for each elected official, all the department heads, the city attorney, mm -hmm. put them all along there and then after the meeting, uh, people have a place they can go and talk to the elected officials, talk to the department heads, uh, which would probably be more open than having everybody in City Hall. That, that, that's a thought I have. Does that, uh, that sound good there? Yes. Sounds yeah, good? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thought I had, and I had more than one thought this week, uh, and that is uh, maybe keeping the, uh, the elected officials coffee. Uh, that I can't say it was well attended, but it was it was a it was a good event that people knew they could come out and sit down and talk to us. We only had several people to come out, but the police, you know, really set the tone on that. They get yeah, people to work. come out. I think it's a good event that we advertise it uh, and do it again like we did last year. We had the coffee on Tuesday. Now Wednesday, I would call on the police this year and the fire uh, to do some kind of interactive activity. The only problem with that, and I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, if you would you know, maybe think about it and come back to us, is that when we did the fire activity last year, it was geared toward kids who were where? They were in school. And so I don't know if it would be better to have a nighttime activity or go and take all the kids out of school. No, we can't do that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, if, all, if, if both of you chiefs uh, would make me brainstorm to have some kind of a a demo that would attract people. Now, in the police department, you don't really have to attract the kids. I mean, adults love to go see dogs. <laughs> you get canines out there, you'll get everybody out there. But anyway, if you would do that, I would like to see Wednesday, maybe, like we did last year, have you guys involved. Uh, Marie, if you want to have an activity at the library, uh, some kind of an open event, you know, maybe uh, open poetry reading or something by the city council. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you probably don't want that. <laughs> Although I've done that before, much to my chagrin. Uh, so anyway, uh, so what I'm hearing is kind of follow the format that we did last year. Same. And maybe look at moving the location. And I'll work with the high school on that, uh, that activity. I'm working with them. Any other, any other thoughts? Give some snacks like Teresa did a great job last year. Yeah, that was, uh, that that was, that was, that was a nice fun. touch. It uh, was. Teresa had the snacks, and the, the little Boy Scouts went out of here. They all had rounded tummies when they yeah. left. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we could actually have open the Warriors Hall. Uh, every table could have a snack table or whatever in order to attract people over there. Okay, good enough. Thank you all for your inputs. 
Now on the next uh, item, the discussion approval of Florida League of Cities resolutions. Uh, what we don't want to do is go through and read, uh, I don't believe we don't want to read 12 resolutions. Uh, we have all seen these because we're all members of Florida League of Cities. And so what I would like to do is ask if anybody has any objections to ones they don't think we should support as a city. And if you don't, then we can pass them unanimously without going through each one. Does anybody object to any of the resolutions the Florida League of Cities are going to put forward to the state legislature? If you do speak now, I'll forever hold your peace. Most of them, you know, focus on protecting protecting home rule, taking care of the cities. Yeah. Uh, so if I don't, I don't hear any any objections, then we're going to support those resolutions by unanimous consent. Yeah. All right. Good. Now we're going to have ordinance uh, 1644, and let us all get to that tab first. It's 14C. I know I go kind of quickly sometimes. And and we lose pages. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, you would read the ordinance, please. I will. Ordinance number 1644 reads by title, an ordinance of the City of Crestview, Florida, providing for the rezoning of 1.43 acres, more or less, of real property, located in Section 5, Township 3 North, Range 23 West, from the single family dwelling district zoning R1A to single or multifamily dwelling district zoning R2, providing for authority, providing for the updating of the Crestview zoning map, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. This is the first reading, <coughs> excuse me, first reading of Ordinance 1644. Okay, Ms. Dale, would you interpret that for us? Okay. Gentlemen, this uh, is concerning the rezoning of 1.43 acres of property owned by the Habitat for Humanity. It is in located in Adams Powell subdivision. It's um, if you will look on your few pages forward on pages 134 and 135 you will see the aerial and the outline of the property. It is uh, to the west of it is actually uh, Adams uh, estate of subdivision that was previously approved and it is in the R2 zoning uh, district. So this property is actually uh, R1A now, which is the most intense uh, zoning we have. It has 30 foot in the front, 25 foot in the rear, and 10 foot on each side. Um, if you come, page 135, where you've got your, uh, the pink indicates the R1A, the yellow indicates the, your R2 zoning. Your difference between an R1 and an R2 is uh, that the rear actually from being 25 in R1 is 20 in R2. Uh, in order, most times you will recognize your R2 zoning as single or multifamily. However, there are criteria for it to be multifamily. These lots will not be wide enough uh, to be multifamily, so they will be five single family homes located on that piece of property if uh, the rezoning passes and their um, development passes. Um, it, they're all proposed to be more than 6,000 square feet and should uh, fit very nicely in the area. Um, the reason it, that it would fail to be developed as independent lots, uh, Lloyd Street North is not open, so uh, the uh, rear lots are actually landlocked back there by virtue of having the small tiny replat of those uh, lots will allow for the development and allow for a roadway a private roadway to to go in for access if there's any questions I'd be happy to answer no one any questions is go ahead are, Mr. are these lots actually part of Adams Powell subdivision Yes, sir. Don't they have some construction restrictions? We're not aware of construction restrictions there. Uh, Adams Powell is a very old subdivision. The, the zoning is currently is R1A, which uh, uh, 
They require an 8,000 square foot lot and they require 30 foot in the front, 25 in the rear, and 10 feet on each side. If this property is rezoned, it will change the setbacks to 25 foot in the front, seven and a half feet on each side, and 20 in the rear. It will mandate that it has to be 6,000 square feet or more. And the proposed lots are actually larger than 6,000 square feet. Well, I just did, I didn't know if uh, there were any covenants and restrictions uh, associated with Adams Powell that would affect this. Mm -hmm. uh, Adams Powell uh, uh, was recorded back in, I think this phase of it was recorded in like 40 or 45. So they very seldom had the covenants and restrictions there. Again, covenants and restrictions are on the civil level. Probably. Comments, Mr. <laughs> been more than 30 years, they probably started. Mm -hmm. Teresa, on, uh, isn't there excess to those two lots are on Lonnie, on Lord Street? Is there any easement there for any right of way at all? There, the right of way is there. The right of way exists. If you'll look in your aerial, it'll actually show right. an area here. Your pavement stops uh, up at Jeff Drive. You'll see the vacant part there. Right. That terrain is like this, headed down well, here. Will that be accessible to those lots? I'm no, no, no. Is, that's what I'm saying. They're landlocked. That, that's exactly they right. They cannot. There's, uh, there's no way to access the the rear of that. That's the reason the uh, need for a small roadway coming in off of Pearl Street. Well, no problem with Lonnie Jack access, but in Lower Street, don't know. Mm -mm. No. And we have a plat, a preliminary plat that has been submitted that works. It has the small right of way that comes along, hugs the inside of the uh, interior there, and allows for uh, five small lots, a recreational area, and a stormwater uh, pond. Mm -hmm. So it will meet the criteria for replatting. Okay, thank you. This is the one we classified as a pud, right? Uh, no, sir. We're we were, we're, at, we were we're at one time, but it is to have it pull through as a PUD would mean it needed something out of the ordinary, uh, which means that it could not fall in a standard uh, zoning requirement. And to do a PUD and the PUD zoning is rather expensive. So these lots meet the criteria of our standard R2 zoning okay. and- I'm just saying the meeting I, I attended, it was, we were looking at calling it a PUD. Um, it's gonna be an expensive venture putting that road in there, but I, but I know they're working on that. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just say that uh, approving things for habitat is really a good thing. If you look at where they're putting homes, they're putting all these homes in Crestview because we have the real estate. They're really helping us out here, so uh, good on them. No more questions. I'd like action, please. One. No, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Fairclaw. Uh, you said their access would be um, off of Pearl Street? Yes, sir. They're going to access all three of those lots from Pearl Street? Actually, there will be five lots in the replat that will be upcoming. Uh, so tonight you're not working on the development of it. You are actually just categorizing. Can they have? I know, but I don't Banner. want I don't want the city to be responsible for paving a street there. No way. That's a private road, sir. The, it's a private road. The city will not pave the street. Pearl Street's a private road. No, no sir. The roadway that will be coming into the development. There's a. Oh, I hadn't seen that. <laughs> This is how this is coming off of Pearl Street and we'll circle around to the five little units that'll be back there. Very nice. And right you down didn't. here is your stormwater pond. Behind those trees is the big ugly drainage ditch known as Lloyd Street. What's that street there in the face of where your fingers are? This is Pearl. This right here is Pearl. That is Pearl. Uh-huh. And this will be a new one. They've given us a name, but I'm not sure it's been approved by 911, so we won't reveal it. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions, comments? Action, please. Mr. President. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Walker. I move to adopt ordinance 1644 in the first reading and move to second reading. Second. Uh, motion second to adopt ordinance 1644 on first reading, move to second reading. Any further discussion? Please vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? 
The vote carries four to zero, one absent. Okay, interlocal agreement with uh, Fort Walton Beach. Yes, sir. Um, oh. The interlocal agreement between the city of Crestview and the city of Fort Walton Beach will allow for their engineering and utility services uh, building and inspections department to perform the necessary building official duties and responsibilities through the time that uh, is necessary for us to fill the vacancy left by the resignation of the Crestview building official. Um, so uh, the public works director, Tim Boa, is here. And if you would like to have any questions answered concerning the the interlocal or how he will they will perform their services uh, if you went through the interlocal you will find that it will it will run in the amount of uh, $42.33 for the building official duties and $25.32 for inspection and I had uh, talked with uh, Mr. Bullock just uh, uh, for a few moments whenever come in we had minor adjustment in the uh, interlocal Concerning the expense for travel, uh, we can just delete that line as it will be covered in in uh, in with the time for paid for the line person. Three. Yeah, uh, down in paragraph three where it right. says has that will just be um, omitted. Okay. You make those changes from. Yes, sir. Right, all right, of them right. is correct. It, it refers to yes, city sir. All so the so yes. Be yes. For you because that's what it says. They that, were all furnished a new one. That is no longer forty-eight thirty-three per hour. It you, is forty-eight thirty-three per hour. I thought you said forty-two. No, forty-eight thirty point thirty-three an hour. Twenty-five thirty-two for the inspector. Okay. Okay. President. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Parker. I got a question prior to any action we need to take on this uh, interlocking agreement. Mm -hmm. The certificates, the expertise, the qualifications, don't we have an in house person on board, Chuck, would meet this criteria for an inspector? I'm not looking for an inspector. I must have a building official. A building and inspector. His past history, yeah. expertise, certificates, he has been one. And is one. He is does not hold the criteria for the building official. That's what I want to know. You tell me he does not. We do not have. We have um, uh, one that is very near. Uh, however, um, uh, we do not have a qualified person to fill the position of building official at this time. Okay. I want to verify and clarify that. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, thank you, Ms. Cox. Oh, yes, didn't uh, uh, the city have a similar agreement with Fort Walton Beach a number of years ago? Yes, sir. Uh, seven or eight years ago. Right. I think I can recall that. Yes, sir. Uh, Tim Bolduck, Public Works Director. I figured I'd make my way up here and speak to you since I'm in here now. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, absolutely, the last time you were in your building official search, we did this for you as well. It will be much easier in, uh, for you and for us this year because there's a lot more technology involved. Um, and so we, we intend to do... Uh, Ms. Teresa asked, you know, what we would charge for travel. We're not going to charge you guys for travel. We're all in the same, you know, service business. Those are the exact burden rates of my two uh, individuals that would be doing whatever services you needed. And so there's nothing additional other than what we pay uh, for their burden rate. So um, we would just charge hourly. But our intent is to perform most of it electronically. So there is a mechanism recently approved by the building industry, by the um, uh, Construction Industry Board and the Building Officials Association that allows us to do uh, off-site inspections. And so we'll work closely with them. Mr. Bilby, who's a fantastic building official for you guys, um, got you set up to do that. So we'll be able to do most of our services remote and save everybody as much time and money as possible. Go ahead, Mr. Faircloth. Have we started advertising yet for this position or do we have to wait until Mr. Uh, Bilby's gone? <laughs> I have the uh, the uh, documentation in the next item that we will go through. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Go ahead, Ms. Clark. And this for a six months period. It will it will go for, it will run for six months or until we have filled the position. Um, when, once that is taken care of and we have actually uh, secured a building official, 
we will bring back another in a local uh, agreement which will allow for uh, services to be um, uh, between the city and Fort Walton Beach at time, such times as either our building official or their their staff mm -hmm. would need to call on one another Reception with an, yeah with an as needed because uh, you have times when they need vacations and since there's will be only one building official when well, I doesn't or do we not have an associate mr. Bills but he had an associate did he not an associate where or what for I thought he had an assistant that we brought a person on board here several months ago that is a that he was a sole bill and an inspector for the city of Crestview Florida you telling me we we have brought several people on board we have um, and we'll get into that in the next the, the next, next item in the next item that. we're more we're more right now we'd like to get the uh, interlocal agreement decided upon so Tim can go home and have supper <laughs> <laughs> you don't need supper. <laughs> All right, any more questions or comments? Can I have action, please? Mr. President. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Faircloth. I move to approve of the interlocal agreement for building official services between the city of Crestview and the city of Fort Walton Beach and allow for the execution of the same by the mayor upon finalization of minor details. Uh, right, so I, I'm sorry. I, I, I meant for us to mark that finally, since the we're removing the expense money, which was the final was the minor detail uh, you can mark that from your uh, so that's already from your, been it's a, yes sir that's what <clears throat> he was announcing okay, there I'll, that we were not <clears throat> in charge I'll strike <clears throat> the finalization of the minor details from my motion all right I gotta find that motion here it is There's a motion and a second to allow to approve the interlocal agreement for building official services between the city of Crestview and the city of Fort Walton Beach and allow for the execution of same by the mayor upon finalization of the minor details. Mm -hmm. I, I, I yep. struck the uh, final details from my And you motion. struck the final, my, my bad. <coughs> that was the travel. Okay. So, ends at the mayor. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, all right. Motion second. Any further discussion? Question. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Walker. Was the county contacted, or were they out of the picture as previous had worked with on inspections? I'm sorry, sir? What about when we had the county do our inspections? Were they just left outside, period, or did you attempt anything at all? Uh, sir, we uh, went back to what was the most successful in, in the past. That's why uh, I'm asking you. Yes, sir. We went back with the, with the most successful uh, we had. We have had uh, interlocals with uh, other municipalities and, and the county. Uh, this is what we used before that was the most advantageous, and it's also the one that we can utilize the digital transfer with and not paper copies, um, we, and which we would really like to do in order to save the expense. The, the transfer of digital can be done by email, FTP site, that type of thing. Whereas if we had to transport paper copies to whoever was going to be doing it, it would, be, it would take time, money for prints, somebody to, tra to query them here, somebody to query them back. It, it's, this is just uh, our most advantageous way to go right now. No question. I worked with these people many years before, so I have no problem with Fort Walton. Mm -hmm. Think about it though. My concern is you schedule an appointment up here for an inspection, he gets landlocked on 23, can't get here for four days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was you going to tell about the sky? Yeah. Okay. Yes, if you'll do yeah, that. New okay. system. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. What we'll do, we we actually use a FaceTime system, so we'll be we'll actually be in Fort Walton and performing the inspections. Which at the same time, will uh, Mr. Bilby create started training of all of your right. other inspectors that you have cross what we call cross training. Yeah. And so what that'll do, it'll serve two purposes. It'll also allow us to continue 
that cross training process with your existing inspectors. We'll just keep filling out the forms for you just like he was doing until you replace them. And then um, we won't have to travel. And so you'll get the same, uh, your residents will be able to get the same service as before. And then if I'm in a bind, you guys can help me out. <laughs> Electronics is marvelous when they work. All right. All right. Uh, we have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries four to zero, one absent. May I ask who second? Yes. I don't have it in my note. Who gave the second? I second. Okay. Who made the one? Okay, you got it. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Now my understanding on the next topic is we're not going to, where are we? I don't have it. We're not going through 56 pages or whatever. Right? No, sir, that's Thanks. just for if y'all want to familiarize yourself with kind it's of what kind we were of thinking. Give us an overview of what you're looking at doing mm -hmm. that department. Well, it, losing our building uh, official has sort of uh, put us into a um, crisis mode to make sure we get everything covered for our, uh, our inspections. Um, I'm not going to go through and read your whole... Uh, agenda sheet. This um, our gears on our standardization. We've looked towards modernization of the whole department, which um, it's, it's been a major concern there at how we can increase efficiency and we can modernize our procedures, our equipment, so that we could have a more streamlined uh, process. Um, also, the, uh, we need to train our staff so that uh, they are operating on today's, um, today's methods and technology, but also the rules and regulations from the modern. Uh, as they have, as you know, your, your building codes, they update each other, they update every three years. It's a course of going back and re-educating. Uh, the standardization plan for the building inspectors, uh, it defined uh, the position and the task, a job description, and supported it with a licensing agreement that would be executed by the uh, individual employees. By that execution, the employee would know exactly uh, what license they were se to secure, also gives them a time frame. And the plan itself actually would have incentives provided for that. Um, with our resignation of our building official, our building inspector too, they've worked here, he's worked here since April of 2000. We would like to actually promote him into the, what would be the newly formed position of the combination uh, inspector and plans examiner. The inspector holds numerous license that we would like to utilize and could he will be able to easily um, complete the remaining commercial requirements and eventually will be able to uh, pass the um, not only the remaining uh, mechanical inspector and electrical inspector and the electrical plans examiner he will be candidate for passing the building official also so that way we will have support in the building official uh, qualifications. Uh, currently, he is at a 2012. We would like to place the um, uh, additional burden upon him to become the combination inspector and examiner. He holds five license. He holds um, his one and two family residential uh, inspector. He, he actually has the building inspector plumbing inspector, building plans examiner, and plumbing plans examiner. Those four which are commercial elements. So we would like his, um, him to be moved to a 2018. Our permit clerks which are, have, shall be completing an intense certification uh, regiment to obtain and hold the ICC permit tech uh, certification. Even though they have already uh, accumulated knowledge of the construction procedures and building protocols. 
permitting requirements and regulations, uh, as well as contract regulations, uh, registration, and insurance requirements. They don't have the document behind it. So what we want to do is in start out with our process of certification, which is also duplicated in the upcoming plan that we will be discussing with you as a way to allow a certification of a multifaceted education in customer service, office and computers, uh, efficiency, complete the te technical and regulatory forms, and reporting, filing organization, organizational systems, accounting, financial accountability, front desk safety, and security. In order to do, differentiate between the clerks and the technicians, we would like the to follow suit with the upcoming plan to take these uh, ladies to a uh, grade 16. The position of the clerk uh, four is set at a grade of 1113. Uh, she has been with the city since uh, September of 2005 and is the senior employee in permitting. And that explains her intense uh, experience in not only blueprints in the Navaline, but the antiquated system where the records dating back for the permits and inspections from 1992 forward. She handles the reporting activities along with the routine permitting and inspection duties um, and reporting, uh, therefore, to agencies. Uh, she will be promoted to the 166, uh, where the testing and certifications are available at this time, and which they will be processing through over the next uh, period of time. Will actually uh, will actually reach a saturation point. It says here of 1610, but we have redone with uh, ICC, and we can maybe. Uh, allow that to the 1612. However, this may take about two years to accomplish. Permit clerk uh, that joined us with, she joined us with uh, June of 2015. She is an extremely fast learner and she has been well trained by clerk four. She handles the day-to-day -day activities, emergencies with ease. She excels in customer service. She is currently at 11, 11 four and shall be promoted to the entry level of the plan, which is 16-1. This will allow for the testing and certifications available at this time, and will should reach a saturation point around 1608 or 1610, depending on the newest generation of your ICC uh, training available for permit technicians. The building and permitting division is a self-sufficient um, uh, agency and it or department and it requires much from its members the monetary changes within the Crestview staff will move them more into the alignment of other agencies the testing and certifications will prove their ability and their knowledge giving citizens more confident about the people that uh, serve them daily uh, our request before you is the creation of the combination inspector plans examiner position, transferring the building inspector two uh, into the combination inspector plans examiner. Uh, the creation of the building, tech, uh, I'm sorry, of the permitting technician position to at grade 16, transfer clerk four into the permit technician at a level 1606, and the permit, uh, transfer the permit clerk to permitting te technician at 1601, which is the entry level there. Excerpts of the proposed plan and the job descriptions, the licensing agreement, training agreement, and all that documentation has been provided to you. The pro proposed plan is a work in progress and will be discussed in an upcoming workshop. Um, the acceptance of the plan is not being uh, requested what we're asking for is uh, approval of the personnel and budget requirements as shown. The funding for these advancements is already shown in your budget uh, under the amount, I think the amount there is about $32,600. And uh, Ms. Betsy will be confirming to make sure that that will allow for it. Your steps and grades there allow for about $30,000. And of course, 
in your budget, you must add your retirement and your the city's portion of your Social Security, your Medicare, and any type of uh, uh, city benefits that must be uh, required there. In the package also is the current building officials uh, job description. And it differs from the others because uh, when the others were prepared, they were dependent upon acceptance of the plan where the department would be renamed uh, the Department of Building Safety, which we will be bringing forward some new development from the uh, building, uh, concerning the building codes that have been accepted statewide where they are utilizing the Department of Building Safety as a broad spectrum uh, uh, title for the building and inspections agencies. Um, is there any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Faircloth. This uh, new Department of Building Safety, is that going to be <clears throat> um, incorporated into our new uh, property maintenance ordinance? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's going, uh, you have an article in the code which allows for building and land use regulations. It is covered now uh, by the Building Inspection Division, uh, so it will more or less be a name change in that. It's not a creation of a new department. It's just that they're trying to urge statewide to, um, I guess, to offer a more uh, descriptive category of what, what they're really, what the building department's really, their goal is, which is truly building safety and they're going to try to work that into the new documentation for the building code. Okay, much of this is going to take two years. Um, are you going to increase these, uh, mm -hmm. um, I'll call them levels, mm -hmm. on the pay scale now mm -hmm. or wait two years until they? Uh, as it shows here, we're going to advance them as they as they succeed their certifications. So okay, and that's the now? reason that we want the funding allotted out. If if these uh, if they can do it in one year, it will be a benefit for us for them to uh, to obtain that certification, uh, and that would allow for instead of coming and asking for an increase that puts them on the level with their peers. I would like to ask you to for the funding that would allow them to join their peers as they meet their qualifications. If they can do it in six well, months. Well, if that's going to take two years, why are, we, why are you asking for it now? It may not take two years. Well, I said it may. Well, it depends. That, that, that should have been articulated in this. It is. Well, it says two years. It's, it said, uh, if you read it, it says, and may take two years to accomplish. And down in the section here, it says to transfer it and include the funding to achieve, uh, like for one of them it's 1612 and the other one is 1601, as this could be a viable possibility depending on the certifications and testing. And for the permit clerk, it's the, it's the same thing as to go to a 161, which will include funding to achieve to a 168, as it may be a viable possibility depending on certification and testing. The ICC has some very strict tests. However, these women are very experienced, very knowledgeable, and they may streamline and, and sort of set ICC on their ear. You know, but that's the only comparable test that we can give them in order to secure that they are operating at the highest level of training that a permit technician can have. This means that they must uh, go through the city's uh, land development regulations and uh, the, as well as the building regulations. They must go through the, your uh, DPR laws as well as, and it's actually broken down in, your, in the very last part where they're, yeah. 
it's on page 179 that where that they will run through uh, they must complete their customer service training the city code and res regulations their front desk safety and security they must complete the D DBPR laws and regulations they must complete their ethic course they must complete the preliminary ICC permit tech regulations and they must complete the um, permit tech uh, institu uh, institutes course completion and secure the ICC permit technician certification so so this training is it like over the computer and they can move up at their own speed or do they have to go classes somewhere some of them will some of them are like online university type things for the the ICC there is one that they must physically come in and take their test so uh, so if, if if all this isn't accomplished <clears throat> in a year then you've got 32,000 in your budget that you didn't need so your budget will be less next year so it will if you don't do it it rolls over into the escrow fund because that's where any additional monies from the building and inspection goes it is not part of the general city's budget if they if they do not succeed in earning it it will stay in the bank if they succeed in excelling it and passing this um, then it's it will be offered to them as incentives for getting them to uh, master this that's it okay other comments questions All right, let me, let me uh, get in here then. Uh, as you know, I met with uh, Jonathan and uh, got a summary from him that I took this home and studied it and came back, made, made some uh, recommendations that he, that he changed in here. But the, the thing that's kind of missing to me that was in the other document, and that was a breakdown. You know, we, we know it's 32K. And we know it's coming out of the, the escrow account of the building fund. But the other one really, the, the one that I looked at before, had a uh, table, which I don't see here. It showed each position, how each position was going to be affected by the possibility of increase in this year's budget. I, I don't see that here. I think. Are I think you talking I your attachment A's? No. Well, no. see, I got this tonight, and I've got something else in my book before that. I don't see. Mm -hmm. Well, I had done I had done this formulation here, where I broke down into what would it would actually amount. I didn't have it in. Um, no, that's what I had when I came in and looked at what you just held up. I don't, I don't have it here. I just but created the, I, uh, I created this today. Well, there I was a one. there was an overall one Jonathan for the position. Jonathan gave you one just like that when I went through the briefing with him. Yeah, I, well, I had given Jonathan one to look at and to mark up for me. So I guess maybe he forwarded that. I, I, I just think it would, it would have been nice mm -hmm. if we had that. Yeah, by all means. Well, well um, the breakdown for it, it shows that they're going to run from grades to stamp. If you're looking at your, um, uh, for the actual dollars and cents for your code, uh, combination uh, code inspector and plans review you'll move from a 2012 to a 2018 which is an increase of ten thousand seven hundred and fourteen dollars and eight cents you and will that's the which code is that the building official no sir that's your you've got a code you've got a building inspector too that's a residential who possesses five license I would I, I I, I'm that. saying I would like to utilize those those four commercial licenses, um, so that he can, he will utilize that, and he will be. Uh, that's the one that'll move to the 2018, and he will move to a combination building inspector and a plans examiner, which means he will be able to digest the plans and mark the plans up. I, I know what that means. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to define the position. 
So it's not, so it's a 10,000, potentially 10,000 raise for the individual moving into that position. Yeah, and the, the uh, position would be, have to be new and have to be created Confused. in the next year's, in the next year's budget. Which it was explained in, in, we've got it in the plan, we just didn't think we were gonna have to utilize it this quick. But with the, with the uh, building official leaving, uh, he has no, he, we really need to call on his other license. Okay, well what I like now then is uh, an input from the city clerk to, we, we had an anticipated budget, so is it really in there? The, or, or um, I worked on that today when I got uh, Ms. Galliard's uh, information. Your original budget that you had that had the um, in section B in your book, or C in your book, mm -hmm. that has the requests, these original requests mm -hmm. for the permit technicians and all that were in there. Now, right. mm -hmm. there was some increases in that, and I looked at that today, and that took it up another $13,000 from what was originally in the budget. You mean above the thirty-two? No, no, no. It took it up an addition. Up, well, no, because the 32 is for everybody right. without benefits. So it's actually more than 32. Um, it increased your bottom line budget, and I don't have the, the $308,000 in there. It took your bottom line budget in building and permitting from $471,000 to $484,000. So basically $13,000 is what these changes in these positions. Which is still covered by their budget, though. It's still no covered by, by their, their budget. Because what, mm -hmm. what you're going to look at, and I'll talk about it when I get up there in a minute, is is we have a uh, $2.5 million cash carry forward. What we will, And there's $572,000 in the current escrow. Right. So we will increase that cash carry forward by the amount that's needed to override any difference between the budget expenses and the j budget projections in the building department, so we're still in, we're still okay. Mm -hmm. But we're do get that? <laughs> no. But we have to to answer Mr. Fairclough's question. Excuse me. You have to budget worst case scenario. We have to budget for the fact that they're going to pass it this year. If they don't pass it this year, then it'll be in next year's budget. But we have to put it in the budget. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter they if can't it's do in it. the... Yeah. Huh? They couldn't do it if you didn't put it in the budget. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it's not... Just because they have their escrow account, legally, it has to be in the budget no matter if mm -hmm. it's from their escrow account or from the general fund. It has to be included in that budget. And if it, when, you, when we get the ad for the agency for the budget there's going to be a line that shows public safety. You have general, utility, public safety, enterprise. Building and inspections and code enforcement, police and fire all fun, fall under public safety. So building and inspections are already in the state obligations for public safety. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, let's see where we are here. No other comments? Can I have action then? Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Cox. I move to approve the personnel and budget requests as shown. I have a motion. Let me get a second. Second. <clears throat> motion second to approve the personnel and budget request as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Okay, we have three, three, four, and one against, and one absent. Okay, now, budget discussion approval. Clerk, I believe you're on the clock.
There's two things that we need to decide tonight. Now, again, with, with what Ms. Galliard just presented, that's already in your budget. Now, there is an increase to it, like I said, of $13,000. That includes all the benefits. When, when Ms. Teresa does it, all she does is the base salary, not the benefits, the retirement, all that. So anytime you increase salary, you're going to increase all that. Um, but what I'm looking for, several things that were discussed uh, in the last budget workshop was when and if we're going to do raises. Since you've passed that, I'll get you final numbers, but we're looking at when do you want to do the raises? When do you want to pass those raises? If you look after the leave sell back page, now it doesn't include the new changes for this one, so I'm going to, uh, the, anything that's not covered, the increase of $308,000, that will be in next year's budget since we're not sure when that's gonna be done, and the increase in wages, that will be added to your cash carry forward. So your bottom line where it says difference in the third column from the right, that's where we stand right now no matter what we do in building the inspections. It's it right before item 15, after the leave sell back page. Um, so that's not gonna change because what we take out of the escrow is gonna be put into the cash carry forward. So your difference isn't gonna change. What I need from you guys is which raise or if raise scenario we're going to do. If we're gonna do 3% 10-1, if we're gonna do 1% 2%, 3 anniversary date, no raise at all. I need to know so that I can finalize to get to you guys before the September the 6th public hearing on what we're gonna do. Unless you want to go over sell back first, because that will that will affect it. <laughs> well, I, I have the same question I had before, and I would I, I really want clarifications. On which one is going to have the least impact on our budget? Uh, because last time you said the one two was going to have a bigger impact, but according to this, it has a lesser impact. No, your one two leaves you four hundred four thousand right. dollars in the bank. But the three percent is four hundred fifty four thousand. Right. So it has a bigger impact. It leaves you, that's your that's your ba that's your balance. You've got four five hundred fifty thousand okay. dollars less. All right. You're right. I thought that was the uh, expenditure. That's no, the that's the balance of left. Okay. Then then I continue to as last time I support the one two. Mr. Cox. Oh uh, yes, I'm going to agree with that um, and back up from what I said at a previous meeting. Uh, I think one, two makes good sense. I'm good with that. That's one and two on the anniversary day. 1% yes. on 10, one and 2% on the anniversary day. That's, uh, that's what you supported last time. Yeah. yeah. The one and two. One th there's a factor, uh, and if we get when everything, there are some requests that, that they all have gone over from several different departments that if someone is going to get a grade change, that's going to happen 10-1. They won't get a 1% and they won't get a 2%. They're going to get, there's the request that there, Mr. Mr. Steele has done some requests where they get a grade step change or a grade change or a grade and a step change. Those have all been factored into this. And that's, all those monies are factored into this and, and that's something that I have to worry about. But if they get a good gra a grade and a step change as part of changing their job description, they will not get a 1% or an additional 2%. They're gonna get the requested grade step change. Right, we need a- uh, Fund for, for the payroll consen department. You're looking for a voter consensus here. I am looking for, well, I seem to have a consensus because I, like a three, Mr. Bocker right. is just looking at me. I think we have a consensus to go with the one, two, right? One, two. I think we need to make a motion because that way I can bring it forward. Action, please. Can I move that we go with the uh, one and two percent? <coughs> second. Motion second to use the one two percent model. <coughs> okay. And that for the discussion. The Hello, plan for the plan for that is that next year it's all we, we set up a scale 
using the uh, evaluation, evaluation forms. forms. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carried four to zero and one absent. All right, now. Now the fun part. Last year, no, uh, ooh, ooh, wait a minute. we're on the sell back part of this. I didn't have any other discussions. Did okay, you? I have one issue on pay raise, but go ahead and when do you sell back first? Since you're up there and I don't want any inconvenience anymore. Well, I'll come back. If, to I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay up here till we finish this discussion. So if you back. wanna do yours well, first, that's fine. Well, if you're gonna be up there anyway, yeah. An issue uh, I talked to you uh, before about, uh, guys, uh, we have an issue that we uh, we didn't complete over 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 a year ago. In the budget hearings, we talked about uh, moving duties from one position to another and increasing the pay associated with the duties. And I have the minutes from uh, 8th of January 2018 in which we had the motion to approve the changes from the administrative assistant to the council uh, to the mayor's administrative position with an increase of 6%. And it got hung up a little bit because uh, we, we had defined what the duties were going to be, but we hadn't decided if 6% was going to be enough or not. So we went into kind of negotiations between the mayor and uh, his assistant and the city clerk, and we never really closed the deal on that. But uh, what really happened was we did transfer duties, even though we didn't transfer all the executive duties. We transferred duties, but we didn't transfer any money. No. We put it in the budget, transferred duties, but we never, we never paid the bill. And so uh, what I'm looking for today is, is is a way to fix that. Uh, what I would like to see us do is to fulfill our commitment to uh, to pay the six percent raise. That was the minimum we were looking for. The question was, were we going to pay more because there were other duties? Those other duties weren't transferred. Okay, so I don't think we owe any more than six percent. But I think we need. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to do that, and then look at. Are we going to transfer more duties? And if we are, if we're going to truly make an executive assistant, which, by the way, is her job title, if you look True. at the Manning document, that's her job title. If we're going to do that, uh, do we need to change the pay, pay scale accordingly? All I want to do this evening is get an agreement that we ought to live up to what we committed to in January and then try to fix anything in the future if we're going to transfer truly executive duties to the individual. Did, did, did I kind of confuse everybody here, or do no. you know what I'm talking uh, uh, about? The <clears throat> just a clarification: an executive assistant is paid less than an administrative assistant. Two two well, grades. More, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, that's the way our system is set up. Our system is set up that an executive assistant is a grade 12, and an administrative assistant is a grade 14. Even though it says executive assistant in the Manning document. Uh, the mayor does have an administrative assistant who is a grade 14. That was changed over last two budget seasons ago. Uh, so she's in a grade 14, not a grade 12. Well, which I mean doesn't make any difference. But that, that aside, that, we, we we can. We I can, mean, all the duties have not been transferred. There's a couple of them that are still not being done. Huh? Yeah. I made that point. Yes. But we did transfer duties without transferring any money, and, and I think we owe to the individual to do that. And then look at, are we going to transfer truly executive duties to the individual and look at what that should account to? That's, that's all I'm looking for tonight. And, and I don't even think we have to vote on it. We, we already voted on it. Yes, we no, had a motion and a second and voted to do it. We just never closed the deal. True. So we're in accord. We're going to. When do you want it effective? Effective. Day one. Uh, 8th of For January 2018. Actually, it was February. Were. February 1st was the day it was supposed yes. to become effective, not 8th well, of January. We, we voted in January, but it was supposed to be effective February 1st. We need to honor what we voted on. No. Okay. But it was supposed to come back for negotiation, and it did not. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying. It, 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 the ball got dropped, and it certainly wasn't the fault of the individual. So that's what we're going to do then, right? That's fine. Okay. That's what y'all want to I'll, do. I'll work with her to get all the duties that were in that list because every, well, all the duties in that list are not being done at this point. I understand. And, 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 and maybe uh, we had, yeah, we had that list. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to sit down uh, and, uh, I don't know. Let's work through that in the future. Right now, let's fix this. 
and then let's fix that for the future. Just to be clear, she started these new duties or additional duties on February 1. We need to pay her from that. That's what we're saying. Right. Right. Retroactively. Right. Yeah. Well, I said 8th of January, but that's when we made the motion to vote effective on February. Yeah. Okay. That was okay. my, that was my, uh, what did I call it, aside. <laughs> okay. After the first of the year last year, after the first of October, uh, there was brought forth before you guys about leave sellback um, by a member of the uh, fire union. Uh, and his proposal was that selling back leave in the month of December would not cost any more money, which is not true because we, I'm not going to use the fire department because they're, they're different. <laughs> but normal 40 hour person is paid for 2080 hours okay so if they have sick and annual he was going just by annual but uh, if we're going to do it we need to do it the way it's supposed to be done um, sick and annual leave if they sell back 40 hours in the month of december it will increase the budget unless they work a week with no pay because so instead of because instead of paying them 2080 hours we're going to be paying them 2,120 hours. That's just the way it works. Um, so I went through, and this is worst case scenario. There's a couple of factors that A, they have to have money in the bank. B, if, we, if they decide to use sick leave, they have to leave 40 hours of sick leave in their bank. They cannot use all their sick leave to sell back. And if there's a set amount of annual leave that an individual can take in any fiscal year. The most you can take in a fiscal year for a regularly hourly employee is 160 hours. So if they sell back 40 hours worth of annual leave in December, they're only going to have 120 hours left to take for that year. They can't sell back 40 and then take four more weeks. Because our personnel manual says, this is the maximum amount of leave you can use in any shape, form, or fashion. If you leave, you can only get paid out for 160 hours. If you're terminated and we decide to pay it out, then they can only be paid up to 160 hours or 120, depending on their position. So on that page we were just looking at, worst case scenario with sellback adds 123000 $297 to the budget. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to cost $123,297 because everybody's not going to do this because a lot of people like to take their annual leave. <coughs> a lot of people like to use their sick leave or they don't have sick leave. So that's how much it would cost to do the leave sell back. That's the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. You know me, I always budget worst case scenario. Don't knock your knee. <laughs> No questions. Well, the problem. Go ahead, Ms. Perkle. The problem with uh, the firefighter that came to you as saying it wasn't going to cost the city any money is that if he takes, we'll just say for the sake of discussion, if he takes 40 hours and sells it to us, mm -hmm. back to us, and he gets that check, then he goes ahead and works that 40 hours, he gets his salary again. Right. So that cost us. Right. That's how come it's, it adds 40 that's hours to everybody. Cost yeah, that's why it's 100. You can't, like I said, unless somebody wants to take a week off without pay, it does cost to where, do sell back. Where, where is it in an ordinance or is it just policy or what that we pay 160? It's in our policy. It's in our personnel manual. That, it depends on the level. It depends on how many years you've been here. It could be 120 is the most you can make. 160 is the most you can, you can take. That's the highest. It's four weeks of vacation. That's in our personnel manual. Well, I don't see anything wrong with taking four weeks of vacation during the year. It's all of what the chief or his, his uh, uh, supervisory staff will permit. But I don't believe you ought to be able to do both. Well, it, what, it would reduce your 160 hours. by if you, t if you sold back 40 hours worth of your leave, because some of these guys have, we, we carry over for emergency purposes. Some of these guys have 200 hours on the books. That doesn't mean they can take 200 hours. That means they can take 160. If they sell back 40 of that to the city, then they can only take 120 hours for the rest of the year. 
or if they've if they haven't taken any maximum amount you can get paid for in annual leave depending on your position is 160 dollars 160 hours so chief, if they take 40 they only get to take 120 more chief do you uh, allow them to approve more than two weeks at a time uh, we do as long as the other manning um, we look at all the aspects of the shift um, if there's nobody else off and all that and they got a, like a big vacation coming up but that rarely happens as far as at one time um, I don't think I've ever had an individual take off using their annual leave for more than two weeks or anything at a time right now we allow uh, shift swaps so as long as they are of equal rank uh, so it's a lot of the guys would do shift swaps and they might like uh, like one uh, Captain uh, Smallwood uh, his family's up in Arkansas but he does a lot of shift swaps with individuals that work his shift as well and so he'll burn a little bit of his annual leave but he might be gone several weeks at a time but that's due to well, shift swaps just quickly when I was building my house I asked my supervisor for four weeks he said, you really expect me to approve this? And I said, well, yeah. He said, if we can go without you for four weeks, we can go without you all together. <laughs> That's it. I've made that comment yeah, Don't before. get me wrong. I do, like I said, it has never come across my desk for anybody putting in for straight four weeks of annual leave. I mean, our guys, because if I, they take one shift off, that gives them, uh, because they're 24 on, 48 off. So as soon as they take one shift off, that gives them almost six days anyway right there. Uh, you know, almost six, about five days. So normally they'll take two shifts. Um, I mean, the 160 hours is not to take it one time. It's spread out over the whole year. So you can take a, a week each quarter if you want to. Yeah, but if he, if he sells it back, he won't. Then, It'll then be he can only work. take three. He only has three weeks left. And the 40 hours, it, it, the, the leave in the fire department is different. The way the sellback policy in the personnel manual goes, it doesn't matter if they're a firefighter and they work. 40, 56 hours a week, they can still only sell back 40 hours. Here Any other comments, questions? Madam Clerk, when, when was the last time we did this as a city? Uh, I don't even think we did it the first year I was here. I know we didn't do it the first December I was here. They might have done it the December before I started. I don't remember, but 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 we were at that point, we were had three hundred thousand dollars in contingency and no reserves, so it was a financial. The first four years that I did the budget, it was a financial consideration. Sorry, what, what, and what we had no, it? yeah, we had no money. To, it, budget. And it wasn't in the budget. For some reason, it wasn't budgeted to do it, but it just increased the budget by that forty hours. I don't know why it was in the budget. That was before I started doing budget, but we'd stop doing it but for financial reasons. Uh, let, let me ask you this then. Have you surveyed any of our sister cities to see if they, they do this kind of a program? Some of them do, some of them don't. It oh. just depends. Some of them do uh, bonuses, which the le state legislature has extremely frowned upon uh, doing bonuses at the end of the year. Uh, matter of fact, they passed state legislation two years ago to stop doing bonuses at the end of the year, Christmas bonuses. Thank you, Mr. Morris. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Well, um, I don't. I don't disagree with the program. I just don't believe you ought to be allowed to sell 160. At one you can't. You, you can only sell 40. Time. Okay. Yeah, that's all you can sell is 40. Okay, I just want to make it clear. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's in the personnel manual now. You may sell up to, you don't even have to sell 40. You can sell up to 40. And the stipulations are, because of our leave policy, it deducts from your leave, and in the policy for sellback, you have to maintain 40 hours in your sick bank. You can't sell all your sick bank. Sick bank. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? If not, uh, look for action if we're going to act. So discretion. Uh, you say we have the money to do it this year. Yeah. Uh, or as long as, as long as we're not nailed down for every year. No, we'd have to do it. Like I said, next year, what y'all have to keep in mind is is we're going to lose 
if the legislation passes and we don't do something else to increase revenue, we're going to lose a half a million dollars next year in the general fund. Mr. Yes, Mr. Cox. I, just, I don't think this is a prudent thing to do. I mean, you can do it if you don't want to do the 40. You can change it to 20, which would cut your obligation in half. You can do what you so. I have had some, some, not only Mr. Smallwood, but I've had some other people come and ask me if it was going to come back up, which is the reason I brought it up. Do hours, uh, they're the eligible to accumulate uh, past uh, year in? We keep a, we just keep a running total, but the amount you, sick leave you can use as much as you need. It's annual leave, we do accumulate it in case, but you can only take a certain amount each year. You can, uh, even if you, even if you, if you have 600 hours in the books and you resign and you give notice, you can be paid out 60, 160 hours, period, the rest of it. What we do is, and then one reason we, when we were trying to do the PTO is we started accumulating. So if somebody has an emergency, we have the ability to say, okay, you can, you know, they have a sick leave, they have a broken foot, um, and they need to take off more time, and they're out of sick leave. If, you know, the sick leave is, there's no limit on how much sick leave you can use. They don't even need a, excuse me. Go ahead, Ms. Fickle. They don't even need doctor's approval to be out more than three days. Have to have that, yes. But if but I, somebody has to take FMLA after you use your you have to use your sick and annual first when you're on FMLA, and if you've run that run out of sick and annual, uh, but your you can use all your sick leave until until it runs out. Is it is it policy that if a fellow officer or in this case firefighter uh, has some debilitating ailment that that would force him to use all of his sick leave can the other uh, firefighters donate anybody sick leave? anybody in the city can donate it by by hours and it does not as long as they leave 40 in theirs anytime you take sick leave out for any reason donate it or otherwise uh, except to use it for yourself you have to leave a 40-hour bank in there Well, I don't see anything wrong with 40 hours. Are you, make, are you making a motion, Mr. Fickle? I would make a motion that we approve 40 hours uh, for just this year. I have a motion to approve sell back 40 hours for this year only. Do I have a second? I have a motion. Do I have a second? All right, motion dies without a second. Thank you. That is the end. I will be re revamping your workbooks again with page numbers. <laughs> Just Would for you. Please? you. <laughs> They're in your book. You didn't look at your book, did you? <laughs> and, uh, um, oh, thank you. Uh, I don't think we need to have another workshop. This was the final thing that was determined. Um, oh, shucks. I know, that upsets <laughs> everybody. Can't believe that. the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have it up, and I'll have it just in your boxes in the next week or so, so you'll have the final numbers. And then, the, again, the budget first public hearing is September the 6th at 530. When you're up there, do you have anything else for us? I'm going around the room now. I don't think so. Okay. Mr. Hall, do you have anything for us? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Mr. Steele, what do you have for us? Nothing, sir. Thank you. Okay. Deputy Chief, anything for us? No, sir. All right. No, sir. Thank you. Chief? No, sir. Okay. Teresa, anything? No, sir. Well, that was a long meeting, but uh, I think pretty productive. I mean, got a lot done. And I went through a lot of stuff. Appreciate the indulgence. But now, if there's anybody in the audience who would like to come up and speak to us about anything, anything on your mind, at this point, you had the microphone. In three minutes. Anybody in the audience, last call. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming.